Happy Sunday, friends. Our media department is so good, it's never regular, right? It's like a whole trailer, it's, it's awesome. But I am so excited to be in front of you guys today. My name is Kendra Monet Daniels. I'm a servant leader, like so many of you here at Trinity. And I'm so honored that Pastor Kristen and Pastor Taylor would trust me with you guys on this Sunday morning. So first, before anything, let's honor our pastors, Pastor Taylor, Pastor Kristen Wilkerson. They're in Florida with their family. Their kids are on spring break. And so I'm holding it down for you guys today, okay? Um, but I'm just so, we've been in such an amazing ser series called For All Mankind. And we've really been driving the whole point home that Jesus is for everyone. Jesus is for all mankind. So if you missed for week one, Pastor Taylor did an amazing job bringing the word, talking about the lost sheep. You know, the lost sheep was the point that there's one, the lost sheep was one in 100. He had 99 sheep, but the shepherd still went and looked for the one. And that's so amazing. We had that in week two and week, in week one. And week two was all about the lost coin. Does he, who was here for week two? Yeah, yeah, that was so good. When Pastor Taylor drove that point home about the bride, the woman who lost one coin and she celebrated with her friends when that coin came back to her. But today in week three, we are going to talk about the lost son, which was just one and two. And uh, this, this word is so special. I've been praying about it all week. God has just been laying it in my heart. So I really hope that this blesses you today. And we're going to jump right into it. Y'all ready, 10 a.m.? Okay, okay. I'm from South Carolina, y'all. Okay, I come from a South Carolina non-denominational code for Pentecostal church where they preached back. So feel free to preach back. Be like, oh, yes, girl, that was good. Let me know that you're here in the room with me, okay? Yes, thank you, thank you. So we're going to start off with Luke 15, 11, and 12. So Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity, for the honor to bring your word forth to your people, Lord God. I thank you for every single person that is in the room under the sound of my voice, Lord. Holy Spirit, allow them not to hear me. Allow them to hear you, Father God. So I just move myself to the side, and we ask you, God, to move. Would you have a word that is for every single person in this room, no matter where they are, Father God? Those who are close to you, those who are far from you, and those who need to come back, would you just bring us all home to you this Sunday? In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so let me get us, let me see who's in the room. Who grew up in church? Where are all my church kids at? Okay, lots of us, lots of us. Good mom and dad of us. Like, yeah, they had us in church. Uh, who uh, is new to their faith? Who's like, would say like, maybe I'm a baby Christian. Yeah, shout out to y'all, okay, for doing this on your own in adulthood. I'm a, we, some of us are a mix of both. I grew up in church, and then I did my little prodigal thing, and then I came back, you know. Um, and who, who has a praying mama? Who has a praying mama? Yes, shout out to the praying mamas. My, my praying mama's right here. Yes, Dr. Marsha Bailey. Let me show you my family real quick, give you a bit of grounding on who I am, okay? So this is my family. I'm going to come over here because I'm going to point everybody out. I'm a proud auntie. Okay, so these are my parents. This is Bishop Bailey. He's preaching right now in South Carolina in his Sunday sermon. This is Dr. Marsha Bailey, my mom. They have four kids. They have four beautiful children, I would say. So this is my oldest brother, Chandler, and his wife, Audrea. He's the associate pastor at our church, Right Direction Church International, South Carolina. And these are their amazing children, Alina and Righteous. Alina's the only girl out of seven grandkids. Like, and I'm the only girl out of four boys, and I have a son, too. I just really thought we were going to break the boy thing, but it's going strong. And this is my brother Tyler and his wife Elise. They are lawyers and like doing their thing. I'm so proud of them. And this is their children, uh, Tyler and David. And they're just keeping the wild Bailey boy thing going. They fight, they're real tough. They knock each other out and get right back up like it didn't happen, it's crazy. This is my brother Daniel and Daniel Jr. right there. And then if we can go to the next slide, I've made my own little family here in New York City. So this is my husband. This is my husband, Jamel, and our son, Langston. And my dad used to always tell me I was gonna have to move to South Carolina if I wanted to get married, okay? And I did it, and it, was, and I, it worked out, okay? So for all my city girls who are single, there is hope out there yet for a Christian man. Don't settle for a Christian man who loves you and loves God more than he loves you. And I'm so blessed for my husband, Jamel. Uh, he is everything. 
I've had the busiest week, you guys, and he helps me so much. So as much as you want a man that can lead you, you also want a man that can help you. We help each other, right? And so uh, I'm so blessed for my family. I stand on their shoulders. They're, they're everything to me. And um, with the family I come from, I have to admit that I've always known better, okay? I didn't always do better, but I always knew better. And this pre preaching about the prodigal son or the lost son is actually a little bit appropriate for me because I tried to do my thing sometimes, you know? I was, a, I was not a sneaky child at all. I was not. I was very well behaved. I just was strong-willed, we'll say that. I was strong-willed. But I might have stressed my parents out a little bit. Okay, we mainly argued about like my clothing. Modesty was a huge, huge deal in uh, my family when it came to me, especially being the youngest and the only girl. We had a lot, of, a lot of fights about that. And one memory where I would say I really grieved my father was, um, it was my 25th birthday, and we went to have dinner at Red Rooster right around the corner. And I told my friends, y'all, we're not going to the club just yet. And if you met me in the club in 2016, no, you didn't, okay? <laughs> Forget about that. Forget about that. I've been delivered, okay? Uh, so I told them, don't dress like we're going to the club. We're going out to dinner with my parents. They're pastors. Like, keep it cute. Keep it modest. But I was 25 years old, and for me, birthday meant, like, I had to be popping out. You know what I mean? So I got dressed at first, and I was like, no, 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 it's not giving birthday. Then I was like, hey, what if I put this skirt on? I was like, a little bit more. It's not giving birthday. What if I put this V-neck bodysuit on? Okay, it's giving birthday. And I walked down the street and I saw my dad's face. He saw me from afar off, just like the scripture. And he said, she done lost her mind. <laughs> he was upset. And to make matters worse, there was a, a college baseball team waiting to eat. And I had to strip by them. And my dad was upset. He was hot. He walked away. And he didn't come back to dinner for a while. I was like, did he go back home? He was really upset. Um, and I, I grieved my father, OK? And so I want to talk about, and who, has anybody grieved their parents before? Yeah, you know, I, we grieved our parents. And we lo always look at the scripture, the parable of the lost son, from the son's perspective. But what about the father? What about the father? So there are some commentaries that call this the parable of the bereaved father. And I thought this was a really interesting perspective because when we go far from God, we don't just hurt ourselves. Our father is grieved. We have a God who loves us, who has invested in us, who has, who has set your path before you. And when he sees us stray from that, that's causing us not to be all that we can be. He is bereaved. And so let's go to the word in Luke 15 and 13. And we're going to be reading a lot of scripture, but like we're in church, so that's cool. Um, so Luke 15, 13 says, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a city of that country who sent him to, to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And man, this is really a story of foolish entitlement, okay? The audacity to ask your living father for your inheritance today. Can you imagine how much that broke his heart? Can you imagine going to your father and saying, I know you were alive, but low-key I wish you were dead because I want my inheritance now and I'm gonna go off to a far country. They didn't have FaceTime. They didn't have text messaging. If your child went off to a far country, that was like adios. I'm not gonna see you again for a while. So he really broke his father's heart. And we're not like this, right? I mean, who in here considers themselves an entitled little spoiled brat? One person, okay, you're honest with yourself. <laughs> None of, most of us would not consider ourselves entitled. But who in here feels entitled that you're gonna live 45 more years so you can always repent later? Ooh. Who in here feels entitled to God's grace? I know I'm sleeping around today, but you know what? God's grace is going to come through. I'm not going to get burned. I'm not going to get anything else, okay? You know what I'm talking about? Who takes for granted that you can live now and ask God for repentance later? And that is so much of what we see in today's common Christian. We live in a culture of entitled Christianity, where we feel entitled to God's grace, and we're mostly asking God, what can you give me instead of who do you want me to become? 
our walk with God is not a, like playing the lottery when we pray, oh, this thing's worth our tithe, pull the lever, money comes to me now, I'm going to be good, and I'm going to get blessed, I'm going to get promotions, I'm going to pray to God for this. Our walk with God should be more about our closeness and our proximity with him than it should be about what we can get from him. And so, yeah, and so many of us are living our lives just taking for granted that we can always come back to the Father later. And so, so many of us that might have gone through a prodigal season, I mean, we're all in church today, so we're doing all right, we're doing all right. But so many of us that might have gone through a prodigal season took for granted that we were under the covering of our Father, and we believe the lie, and the lie tells us that things are better over there. Okay, it's hard being a Christian. It's not that much fun. Things are better in the streets. Things are better when I was wilding. You know, when I plucked my husband out of the streets, I'm sure he believed the lie that things were better out there. I'm just kidding. I didn't pluck him out the streets. I'm just kidding, y'all. He was serving God when I met him, okay? But we believe the lie that things are better over there. You're enticed by the world. You might even believe the lie that the people out there are going to love you more than the people in the church, depending on your experiences. But let me tell you that God is not like that nasty church lady that told you that you weren't good enough. Our father is a father who loves us because even though he knew that his son was going to go squander his wealth, he gave gave it to him anyway. Isn't that just like God? giving us free will. Has anybody ever like prayed about or not prayed about what you should do because you know God is going to tell you and then you have to use the excuse like, dang, now I really heard from him. Now I got to break up with him. So I'm not even going to pray about it. I'm not even going to bring this to God because I want to do things my own way. Our father loves us so much that he gives us free will even when, we know, even when he knows that we're going to go and mess it up anyway. But when you are set apart, the world doesn't work for you. I'm sorry, when you know better, all of us who raised our hands and said we grew up in church, congratulations, you're called higher than your friends. Congratulations, you will be held to a higher standard. You will be judged more harshly because guess what? I'm sure he wasn't the only person working the pig pen, but the other people in the pig pen, they don't have anything to repent for. They don't have anywhere else to go. The pig pen is all that they know. But when God has called you higher than that, you are not like everyone else. You can't get away with everyone else. When it's time to pray and fast and you decide not to fast, guess what? The enemy's coming after you because you have been put on his radar, okay? So I know that we live in um, a very, uh, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual kind of world, right? So for the people of TikTok, y'all know know there's witch talk out there? Have y'all heard about witch talk? While the girlies are talking about spells and everything that they can do, the spiritual world is real. The spiritual world is very real. And so you can play, but um, when we pray, Jesus is the only one who has already paid the price for these transactions in the spiritual world. I'm trying not to get too deep into it, but I want you guys to understand that when you have a praying mama and she has prayed over you, then your name is already floating around and the enemy already knows that you've been covered. He's already said, even when, um, even when the enemy asked if he could attack Job in the Bible, Jesus, he said, hey, your, your servant Job, he's good because you have your hedge of protection around him. He has his angels all around him. Thank God for my mama's praying that had, her, had angels all around me. When I was trying to live in the slop, I was called higher. But I want you guys to know, you can't live like everybody else does. Why can they get away with this and nothing, everything goes right for them? That's not who God has called you to be. God's truth is that he is there to cover you. Our God is not here to control you. He is there to cover you. He wants us to live under the protection of his covering. And what we see the prodigal son do here, he left his covering. He squandered his wealth, and he got a gift, but he misused it. What gifts are you misusing today? What has God given you to steward that you might be squandering today? And for all of us, it may not be that big of a deal of heaven or hell, of righteous or wrong. It might just be there's a gift that God has given you and you're choosing like, no, 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 I don't want to do that. It could be as simple as there's an assignment at work that you know you could step up and cover, but you're not going to take that. It could be a friend in your life who you know is far from God and you're on the phone listening to her as she tells you the drama that she did this weekend. And you're like, you know, no, no, I'm not going to be that friend that's going to call her higher. When God gives us gifts, he wants us to multiply them, and he wants us to use them for his glory. I mean, even when I look at my situation, 
I, got, I moved to New York from South Carolina when I was 21 years old because I got an internship at a major magazine and I was so excited about it and I was just about to be Carrie, the black Carrie Bradshaw was just like calling me, I could see it, it was gonna be me all day and I was like, God, you're just gonna, in the time it was fashion, now I'm in beauty, but I was like, God, you're gonna make my name great in the fashion industry and he said, I'll make your name great if you make my name great and um, then I forgot about that second part and because of that, I was squandering my gift. When you're called higher, you don't get to be like everybody else. So I could have, if I was anybody else, I could have just moved here, gone to work, gone home, gone to One Oak, gone to Up and Down, who's in the room? Okay, y'all don't know those clubs, good for y'all. Could have done my thing and it would have been fine. But when I tried to live like everybody else, New York City turned into a wilderness for me. I would get a job and it would be great, and then they would downsize. And if, you were, if you've been at the church for a while, you know you probably prayed for me to have a job at least five times, Lord. Oh, my goodness. I was always in the prayer line, like, I need a job again. Did you just get one? Don't ask about that, okay? I need a new job again, okay? So if you can't keep a job, you're not a bad person. We've all been there. Shout out to everybody who can't keep a job. Oh, okay. <laughs> I can keep a job now, though. I can keep a job now if you're watching. I've been steadily employed. But uh, I was not called to live like everybody else. So me trying to fit in with the pig pen caused that to be a wilderness season for me. Things that God wants to bless, will turn, a place that God wants to bless can turn into a wilderness when you're not doing it the right way. So my first point that I want everybody to have in here is to remember who you are. Remember who you are as a child of God. Don't confuse your situation with your identity. Don't confuse your experiences with your calling. Just because something might have happened to you, that doesn't mean that that's who you are. Just because that's where you are today, that doesn't mean that you, were, you will be there always. And you might be in a situation, but you don't have to let that situation get inside of you and cause you to pretend to be like the people that you're around. That I can always, every time I think about remember who you are, that's something that my father always told me. When I went to college, he would see me and be like, Kendra, remember who you are. You're not like them. Remember who you are. And that saved me, that word to remember who I, who I was. It would be like I was like, I would be at a party and feeling like a tourist. You know, you're a tourist. You're like, okay, I'm going to act like y'all right now, but this isn't who I am. I can't stay here for long. And I remember my mother used to tell me, so my mom, I'm going to tell you a little bit of your story, Okay. My dad would be like, use your own testimony. But, you know, I'm going to use my mom's testimony a little bit. But my mom, she was one of four as well. And my grandmother was married to my grandfather until she wasn't. And then he packed back up and went to Louisiana and left her in Newark, New Jersey with four kids. And they were stable and then they weren't. And so then they got a little bit unstable for a little bit. The kids had to separate. And they moved out of what was their nice neighborhood into a rougher neighborhood. And my grandmother used to tell my mother what? She would tell her, you might be in the hood, but don't let the hood get in you. That's not who you are. This might be your situation, but don't let it get in you. So I don't know what your situation is. You're like, I might be here. I might be in the projects today, but it doesn't have to get inside of me. That doesn't have to be who I am. I might be, you know, pinching pennies today, but this doesn't have to become my identity. I might be battling with same-sex attraction, but this doesn't have to be my identity. I am called higher. I need to remember who I am. Don't confuse your situation with your identity. Don't eat the slop. Okay, he looked around and he thought about it. He was like, man, I'm hungry. This lot looks good. But then he remembered who he was. Don't lower yourself to the level around you. Luke 15, 17 to 21 says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. You see, that's a heart posture change. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, now that's good because he got up, but he was still a long way off. His father saw him and he was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. He had prepared the speech earlier. You saw that? He was ready. He didn't even get to finish it. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, if this was a movie, I, this would be like the climax, okay? This would be the homecoming, repentance part. You know, the first important thing here is that he came to his senses. He made a decision. 
he decided, this is not who I'm going to be anymore. And he was still there, but he decided. You have to decide in your heart before your feet can move. And some of us are trying to live our lives the other way around. I'm going to get right when I get there. I'm going to start serving once I stop sinning. I'm going to get more involved in the church community once I feel like my life is, is good enough and is at a certain level. Let me tell you, it doesn't work that way. You have to make the decision to go first, and then your, heart, and then your feet will follow. Your, heart, your feet will follow your heart. Once you set your heart in a good path and say, this is what I'm going to do, that is the first step. Your mind will follow, and then your feet will father, follow. He went from, Father, give me like we were talking about earlier, what can I get from you to Father, make me? And I think that is a big heart posture that all of us can check ourselves on and say, God, am I asking what I can get from, from you more than I'm asking about who you have called me to be? Repentance simply means to turn away. And it can be a really big, big thing, right? Like, oh, God, I need to repent. You know, I need to repent. Repentance, needing to repent doesn't mean that you had to have been living at a lowly level because we're all at different places in our walk, right? Yeah. Repentance simply means turning away, and repentance is our bridge to the Father. Repentance is our bridge to walking back. See, Acts 17.30 says, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. And so Paul was talking to these, was talking to the new Christians and saying, like, back in the day, you used to have your gods made out of stone, made out of wood. Like, that was cool because y'all didn't know better, but now you do. And so now you're called to repent. And so I'm sorry, everybody in this room, now you know better if you didn't know before. Now we're called to repent. But let me tell you, he will get you one way or another. And he can get you from surrendering or he might get you when you're down in the slop and you look up and you say, I have no choice. It's back to my father or eat the slop. It doesn't matter how you come back to him. He will get you one way or another. And so when I, it reminds me of my story when I was living in Hell's Kitchen. I think actually I was on 53rd and 8th at the time. And uh, when I first moved to New York, I told this guy that. And he was like, no, nah, don't tell people that. They're going to think you rich. Tell them you live in Hell's Kitchen. I was like, okay. <laughs> I didn't understand New York apartments at the time. But I was in this box of an apartment. I was, and I, and I wasn't, wouldn't say that I was doing anything crazy, but I was called higher, right? And I was just getting by, and my relationship with God was on the back burner. And I had this moment, I had weeks where I was being waken up every day at 3 a.m. And I was like, oh, my God, I want to go back to sleep. And then after it started, kept happening, I was like, man, this is God. This is God tugging me. This is God calling me back. And so I couldn't sleep, so I put on some music to try to go back to sleep. And thankfully, I had my mom's old phone home because I used to always lose my phone as well. I've been delivered from losing my phone. Praise the Lord. I've had the same phone for a while now, but I used to always lose my phone. So I had my mom's old phone, and it had some music on it. And so I pressed play, and it was a song, um, Come Out of Hiding. I don't know if anybody knows it. Is a, come out of hiding, you're safe here with me. There's no need to cover what I already see. You've got your weakness, that might be the wrong word, but I hold the key. So the song is basically saying like, I loved you before you knew you were lost. I saw it all and still chose the cross. And I got on my knees and I said, okay, God, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? Me, by myself, in my apartment, I came, made the decision to come back to God in that moment. And there was no, there was no worship team there. There was no pastor there to lead me to the altar. I created an altar in my bedroom, and I made a decision in my heart that I was going to start living for God. And it took me, it took me a while because my, my environment, I was, I was in the slot. So it's hard for some of us who say, okay, God, now is my time. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to live for you. But your friend's in the slop. Your friends, are, your friends are picking up the pig food. And you're expecting that you can stay clean in, in the slop? That's not how it works. You have to remove yourself from the slop. So it took some time for me to change my relationships, for me to lose those old patterns, for me to lose those old habits. But I made that decision. And as I made that decision, there were some lies that started to come into my head that said, you're no longer worthy. You've gone too far. I know God called you here, but you already lived like this. You might as well keep living like that, right? 
And let me tell you, purity culture in the church messed up a lot of us, okay? Because once you were deflowered, oh well. You're never going to be perfect again. You're never going to be pure again. You might as well go as far as you can go. It doesn't matter now. Let me tell you that is a lie from the pit of hell, that anything that you've been through does not decide what your future can be, that it doesn't matter how far you've gotten from God. You have a father whose arms are open and ready to receive you. Okay, don't listen to the lie of the enemy that tells you just because this is where you come from, because your mother's never reached this level. Nobody in your house is, nobody in your family has ever owned a home. How could you own a home? Nobody in your family has ever been a business owner. How could you be a business owner? You don't come from these people. How can, you don't deserve this job title. You're the only black person in this office. You're the only Latina in this office. You're the only woman in this office. You don't deserve to give that presentation. That is a lie from the pit of hell that you are not worthy. And we have to shut that down and be just like the son when he looked up he came to his senses he remembered who he was he remembered that he was a child of God he remembered that he doesn't have to do this okay like sorry that reminded me of dating okay you ever go on a date women and the time to split the bill comes and he not even moving for his wallet I don't have to do this, okay? There are men who want to take me out and pay, okay? I don't have to do this. <laughs> I am worthy. I, I don't, I know. Okay, sorry. We're going to get back to the nose. <laughs> the lie is that you are no longer worthy, but the truth is our Father is waiting to embrace you. Our Father is waiting for you to come back. And if we can go to Luke 15, 22, and y'all, Pastor Taylor gave me the longest parable. Ain't that something? His, his parable was a couple scriptures. He gave me the one with all the scriptures. But Luke 15, 22 to 24 says, But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fat and calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Isn't that so good? His father didn't just, just welcome him back. He didn't just embrace him. He restored his dignity. He said, let me clean him up so it doesn't even look like he was in the slop. You can go through fire. You don't have to smell like smoke. You can go through addiction. You don't have to wear that on your sleeve like your identity for the rest of your life. You can find freedom and you can be restored in dignity. Isn't that so good? Our father doesn't just, he didn't just say, here's some water. Give him some bread, put him out back, he embarrassed me. <laughs> no, he said, I'm going to kill the fattened calf. And you guys, the fattened calf in this biblical time, it represents two things. One, if you think about the fattened calf, I mean, that means that this calf was special. This doesn't happen overnight. They had been grooming this calf for months, you know, f to make sure that he was ready for a sacrifice. But also what we see in the, in, about the fattened calf in Leviticus was that the fattened calf was always offered as a sin offering. And he said, it's okay, I covered you. I'm going to shed this blood about your sins. Don't worry about it. You could deserve something worse, but don't worry. We're going to kill this fattened calf and make a sacrifice so that you are once again clean before the Father. It is so powerful that our God doesn't just want us to get by. Our Father wants to bless us abundantly. When we come back into his house, we have the gift of abundance for everything that we need, for anything that our heart desires that is within our will. Our God wants that for us. But his brother was salty. Okay, he was a hater. So verse 25 says, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. Can you imagine being mad about music? Like, who rained on your parade? So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has, because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. What a good father. Even though he wasn't acting right, the father still came out and pleaded with the other son because he loves all of us. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we, have to we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Let me tell you, the bitter brother 
is who you don't want to be. And let's reframe this again, right? So Jesus is in the last days, in his last days, as he's telling this prophecy, as he's telling this parable, excuse me, because the Pharisees were trying him, okay? They were trying him, they're testing him, and Jesus spoke in parables twofold. He said so that it can be concealed, but also so that the truth can be revealed. And so he had to conceal the truth because they were just waiting on him to say anything so that they could kill him. You know, they were saying anything so that they, they can go ahead and speed up this crucifixion, crucifixion process. But Jesus spoke in this parable so that he could reveal the truth, but also keep from the Pharisees who were persecuting him the fact that, yes, I am the Messiah, but you're going to have to wake up early in the morning to get me, brother. I'm not going to give it away just like that. So the Pharisees are who were just like the older brother. They were so stuck in their ways. They were so self-righteous that the Messiah was in their face and they were ignoring him because of their tradition, because of their religion. They were so full of righteousness that they couldn't see the Messiah. They had BPE, big Pharisee energy, big Pharisee energy. That is what we don't want. They had grown bitter because their holiness wasn't celebrated. And I think some of us can get like that if we're not careful. I've been doing right. Kendra up there talking about her prodigal moment. I never had one of those. I was better than that. You know, but I want to tell you that it's worth it. And don't get weary in your walk. Don't get weary in your walk. The keys could come. Because the lie will try to tell you that your faithfulness has been for nothing. The lie will try to tell you you've been praying about the same thing for years. You have the same prayer journal. You got that same picture up in your closet. That vision board looked just like it did in 2020, girl. Where, where is it in reality? Where, what, is, what is going on with the manifestation? The lie will try to make you think that your faithfulness has always been for nothing. But let me tell you, the truth is that he's always with us and that everything that he has is ours. And we may not understand God's timing. We may not understand why we're in the situation that we're in. But he has never left us. See, the brother was so worried about the fact that he killed the fattened calf for his brother, that he ignored all of the meals that he had morning, noon, and night with his father. All of those opportunities to commune with his father. And the thing is that he was, the father was celebrating that the brother, the son had come back. He was celebrating an opportunity for renewed closeness. Do you notice that he celebrated the fact that he came back before he asked him what he did? Before he asked him where he'd been, where he'd gone? Is the fact is that we have a father that loves us beyond any mistakes that we could ever make. We have a father that sees us perfectly, that when you decide, all you have to do is decide to lift your head up and he will put that ring on your finger. He will put that robe on your back. He will clean you up no matter what you have been through. That is the father that we serve. And so the lie might tell you that your faithfulness has been for nothing, but I wanna encourage you, don't get weary in your walk. Don't get weary in your walk when you're believing God for your family to get out of the cycle of poverty and you've been praying and you've been tithing and you've been faithful. Don't get weary in your walk when you are believing for healing, when you want to see that scan, be free of tumors, when you want to be healthy and whole. Don't get weary in your walk when you are the bereaved parent. When you are the bereaved mother or father who has a child who is wayward, maybe you have a sibling who is battling addiction, maybe you have a child who is far from God, don't get weary in your walk when you are believing God for the manifestation of the things that he told you because I know that when God told me something, I am going to see it in the land of the living and I stand on that. So this is for anybody who is standing on a promise from God. Don't get weary in your walk, do not allow manifestation happening to the left of you and happening to the right of you distract you from the fact that you get to dine with the Father morning, noon, and night. Don't allow it to distract you from the ways that he has already blessed you, from the ways that he is already with you. Because we serve a good, good Father who is with you when you are close and who loves you from when you're far away and he sees you when you're far away off and when you lift your head and make that decision, we serve a Father who will meet you right there. Isn't anybody glad that we serve a Father who loves us no matter what we've been through. So I want to encourage you today that we are all the lost son. We all have to make that decision to lift our head up and to say, hey, I'm better than this. I'm worth more than this. I'm called higher than this. It's my opportunity to repent, which means to turn away from where I'm going, to rise above the slop, 
to get to where God has called me to be. And some of us are bereaved parents. You might, it might be not even a parent, it might be a sibling or, a, or it might be um, some of your own relationship, an estranged spouse. Love anyway, love anyway. Hey, you always have more love to give. That's what I love to say. Don't be afraid to love when we serve our God who is love. You have enough. No one can take that from you. And you know what? Some of our hearts have grown bitter because we've grown weary in our walk and we feel like that second son. Like, I see it happening for everybody else. When is it going to happen for me? I want to encourage you, don't underestimate our, father love, our Father's love for, me, for you. He loves you so much that he is willing to do whatever it takes to get you back to him. And when you come back, he has no questions. He has no questions about it. You're already worthy. You're already worth it. And you're already celebrated the moment you make that decision. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to pray for us today. There's a couple of people in the room. I want to pray for those of us who feel like the, the bereaved parent, who have someone in our life who is far off from God. And I also want to pray for those of us who are that person that's far ourselves and need to make that decision today that even though the rest of my situation may not look like I'm ready, I'm going to decide in my heart I'm ready and let my life follow. Amen. So Father God, thank you for everybody under my, the sound of my voice today who has heard your word, the way that you have spoken to them in the way that only you know, Father God. Would you just heal our hearts? Would you heal the heart of the bereaved Father, Lord God, who is believing for redemption and reconciliation with a child or with a spouse, Father God. We thank you that you've already done it and that you've brought them home, Father God. And I pray for anyone who is far from you right now, who might feel like they're lost, who might be eating the slop, Lord God, would they lift their head up and realize that it is better where you are in Jesus' name. So if we could say this prayer together for those of us who've prayed for the first time, maybe you've heard this word for the first time, I want you to raise your hand if that's you and you're making the decision today that I'm going to repent and I am going to go back to the Father who has called me. If you're in this room, let's pray this together. Father God, we thank you for your son. I know that he lived. I know that he died. And I know that he rose on the third day for my sins. So Father, no matter how far away I might have gone from you, today I come back to you and I welcome your embrace. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's give it up for everybody who made that decision for the first time today. Thank you so much.